to Word First Radio. Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome to Word First Radio, the podcast brought to you by Word First Ministries. I am your host, Jacob O'Neill, and as always, I'm joined by my friend Cameron. What is up? Oh, nothing much. Uh, <laughs> well, today, <laughs> today we're going to talk about uh, a pretty heavy topic, but um, we were recently asked about it by someone, uh, just a random guy who overheard us talking in the public library during our skeptics evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, if you don't uh, maybe keep up on our Facebook wall or Instagram, every Tuesday night, we have something called skeptics evening. Mm-hmm. So what this is, is we create a space and an opportunity for people to get together and talk about topics related to Christianity and faith. And it gives us an opportunity to you know, show how you can be a reasonable person and be a Christian at the same time. So the idea around this group is that it appeals to generally a pretty uh, specific person, someone who wants to come and kind of argue and debate. Um, and yeah, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty much what the group is. Yeah. So we were talking about um, slavery in the Bible, Ooh. Very briefly, um, I'm, I don't have to get into how it got brought up, but it got brought up and we were talking about it really only for a few minutes and somebody on a, at a different table overheard us mm-hmm. and thought, you know, I want to butt in because I have a question. Yeah. These guys seem like they read the Bible. Uh, this, is, this is the thing. I got it. And he came in and he was like, hey, so why in the Bible does God say it's okay to beat your slave as long as he doesn't die within a day or two? Mm-hmm. And as soon as he asked that, my kind of reaction, at least in my heart, was like, oh, brother, uh, yeah. because uh, the Bible doesn't say that right? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it doesn't say that. Um, I know what he's talking about. There mm-hmm. is a verse in Exodus 21 that sounds a little uh, disconcerting. So that's kind of prompted me to uh, suggest to Cam, we should definitely, for the next Nor- when Norwegians ask, yeah. definitely talk about this issue yeah, because yeah. I think there's a lot more to say about it mm-hmm. than what uh, online public discourse would have you believe. It's, oh, the online discourse about it is so bad. It's Especially com- coming from the sort of social media atheist community. Mm-hmm. It's it's so bad. Right. It's not even starting to starting to take the topic seriously, which is really which is really a shame. Yeah, it is a shame because uh, the actual topic is uh, is really really interesting. Mm-hmm. And it's um you know, it's kind of it's interesting when you think about the history of Christianity and the anti-slavery abolitionist movement. Right of every form of slavery, right. not just a few forms of slavery. <laughs> uh, Christians uh, have been a consistent voice mm-hmm. throughout history yes. in the abolitionist movement. Right Now, there were uh, Christians, uh, so-called, who abused some of the things the Bible says about mm-hmm. slavery yeah, to justify sure. their sinful actions. But uh, basically, I made a, like, like a ranty post on Facebook about it, uh, trying to say that there is a reason why Throughout history, through Christianity's entire history, there's been a consistent voice against slavery, and it's because, not in spite of, because Christians were reading their Bibles, they yes. were reading their scriptures. There, yeah, there is a le- well. T- I'm sure we'll get there, mm-hmm. but there is a letter in the New Testament mm-hmm. with the authority of an apostle to a slave owner, right. telling him, "This slave is your brother, not your slave." Mm-hmm. Which is pretty uh, radical. So, yeah. So yeah. it's hard. It's hard to square that against the um, unsubtle, unnuanced idea that the Bible condones or endorses slavery. Yeah. So I think the first uh, kind of the first point I want to address with this, uh, we can talk about some verses or maybe yeah. concepts as well. Um, but I, I think, you know, usually when I talk about this with people, I kind of lay out just up front, because I think you can lay this out up front, that I, I think the Bible teaches that God considers and that slavery is uh, a sin against God. Yeah. It's a sin to own another human being. It's not good. You shouldn't do it. If you're a slave owner, they need to not be your slaves anymore. Right. Um, slavery is a sin against God. God. Um, and I'm sure there's uh, uh, maybe uh, Cameron, you can uh, read uh, something on that. Uh, but I, one, of the, one of the places I go to that is in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 10, uh, 1 10. 1 Timothy 1 10 teaches that those who are enslavers, those who are enslavers are disobedient, ungodly, and sinning against God. Yeah. Now, the word here uh, is really interesting 
because it actually refers to uh, like man stealing. Mm-hmm. Like your person stealing, right? So taking somebody's freedom, yeah. buying and selling human beings, especially like Americans and British people were the slave yeah. trade, right? Uh, Paul says they're disobedient and ungodly mm-hmm. and sinners. Yeah, that's pretty clear to me. Um, he puts them up. He puts it up there with like murder and like a bunch of other sins in First right. Timothy one. But that's definitely not a verse you see people talk about these days. No, and we he- yeah. so here's the thing: mm-hmm. we, we need to be fair. We do need to square that against, okay, well, what's all this stuff in in Exodus about? What's this stuff in Leviticus about? What's right. this stuff in Deuteronomy about? Sure. Or it sure seems like there are rules about how to beat your slaves or something like that. I, bet, hmm. I guess that's a really coarse way of putting it. But the the Christians, we have work to do. We can't just say, mm-hmm. no, the Bible says in this place slavery is bad, mm-hmm. and then pretend that all the other passages don't exist. So, don't hear us doing that's that. That's true. But yeah. maybe let's get some concepts out on the table. In the West, in the United States in particular, we recoil at the word slavery because we imagine slavery as just one thing. And we have such is we have such a um there's not a word bad enough for it, such an evil history mm-hmm. in our country with keeping humans as slaves. Right, right. And it's something that Anthropologists and historians they call chattel slavery, mm-hmm. uh, which we'll talk about in a second. But we let, okay, so let's let's just di- let's turn the heat down a little bit and let's think clearly about things. And if there are things that are like really awful and immoral and terrible and tragic and evil, we'll talk clearly about mm-hmm. them. But let's get our concepts out on the table. Slavery is not just one thing. Slavery right. conceptually refers to a whole basket of practices, Mm -hmm. some of which are worse than others, that share a certain feature in common. And that feature is something like the willingness of the person who the of the person who's being forced to do something. Hmm. So something like that. I'm being imprecise on purpose. But it's like there are these various practices that rightly belong in the same basket, Mm -hmm. but they're not all equally awful. And they're not all at they're not at all the same practice or the same thing, and they're all bad, mm. and but some of them are worse than others, and we can't treat them all as the same thing, right? Or as sort of the worst evolution of slavery is probably what was practiced in the in the West, especially by the British and the Americans after after about the time of Christopher Columbus. So mm-hmm. after that, the time of sort of that new the discovery of the New World. Um, the dominant kind of slavery became this chattel slavery. Chattel sla- slavery is man stealing. Right. It's capturing people. Mm-hmm. Um, there's often the the racist connotation thrown in that other people deserve to be slaves and, sure. and not us. Um, but it's the idea that one person can own another person mm-hmm. just like any other kind of property, just like just like an ox or mm. a chair. Or sure, a tool, sure. or a plow, that one one human can own another human for his whole life, mm-hmm. and ordinarily, including his offspring. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you own, oh, I'm putting uh, hear the air quotes when I say this because I don't believe humans can be rightly owned. I only believe that they can be oppressed mm-hmm. in this in this sense. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's legitimate. That I don't think you can. Doesn't matter who signs the paper. You yeah. can't own me. You can't buy into the human being. You can't buy not you, literally. Yeah. Well, not literally. Yeah. But mm-hmm. we can trade money, and then someone else can threaten me to the yeah. extent that I that I submit. You can pretend like you have. Right. But you, yeah. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. but the the idea is the concept is if you own a person. And then they have they have kids. You own those people too, right? Just like if you have two cows mm-hmm. and they have calf, they have kids. Sure, I know baby cows aren't called kids, but those cows produce offspring. You own those cows also. Mm-hmm. So it's treating humans as mere property, right? Is like the latest in the horrors of human slavery. Mm-hmm. But there are other things that were slavery also that all get the same badge. They include um, indentured servitude. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so a person can choose to sell himself as a laborer to somebody else and have a contract, mm-hmm. and maybe it's for life or a certain amount of time. But I, what would happen is a person would sell himself into the service of somebody else. Mm. There was debt slavery. If you were in debt to somebody, yeah, you yeah. couldn't pay the debt off. Then you sort of were involuntarily <laughs> <laughs> uh, indentured to that person. 
And then we also have most of the slavery probably in humanity has been slavery of punishment or, or conquest. Mm. So you have warring people and one people conquers another people right, right. and takes those people as slaves. Mm -hmm. And then there, there've been different systems and rules and structures around that. Sure. But all those are the very broadly, those are kind of the four categories of slavery. Mm -hmm. You have like the, the, the debt slavery, indentured servitude, chattel slavery, and then sometimes it's called slavery as punishment, mm -hmm. but um, it's usually in terms of conquest. Right. There's the, somebody conquers another people, and what they ordinarily do is take those people as slaves, which all of those things are horrible, but mm -hmm. they're not the same. Yeah. They're not I, identical with one another. I think that's a really interesting um, or important point to make, you know, that slavery has not always looked the same throughout humanity's history. Mm -hmm. And has been motivated by different things, yeah. th and are and some are more or less severe, if you will. Even mm -hmm. if all of them are not good, some are clearly worse than others. Yes. Like I, I think it's uncontroversial. Well, who cares? I think it's uncontroversial to say that something like indentured servitude, it generally is less severe than like chattel slavery right. or like man stealing. I, yeah, I, that, I, that I have is, no problem agreeing with that. Right, right. That, but I mean, just to say that yeah. one is worse than the other doesn't mean that. Either of them are good. Exactly. Yeah. And so, but that's good to get that on the table. Um, probably even first, they get that on the table that slavery, uh, the word itself, uh, you're right. We recoil when we hear it because yeah. what instantly comes in our minds is chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of intuition loaded heavily. You know, right. when we use the word slavery or when Bibles or ancient documents choose to translate um, their, uh, their words into the English word slave, mm -hmm. we instantly think of like, you know, the Southern states, or we think right. of the British colonial, you know, slave trade, things like that. Yeah. Uh, we think of the African people who sold their people into slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's horrible. It's yeah. wrong. Uh, the problem is, is when you enter these discussions, that's just not what's in mind or in view right. when we're talking about slavery in the book of Exodus, for example, right. uh, yeah. or in the New Testament. Right. Almost, almost certainly wasn't. So that yeah. kind of slavery mm -hmm. that was practiced since um, discovery of the new world Became dominant at that time, but was mm -hmm. it's not that it didn't exist, but it almost didn't exist for the rest of human history. Mm -hmm. And all of those other kinds of slavery were universal for all yeah. of humanity and all of human culture. It wasn't even slightly uh, maybe I'm overstating it, but it was taken for granted as mm -hmm. something that as something that humans do, and it's evil. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't a culture society that didn't practice it or really thought of it as evil. And so I, I know that's a point we're going to make later. So I don't mean to sort of let the rabbit out of the hat now. Mm -hmm. Let the cat out of the bag. Take the rabbit out of the hat. Yeah. Pick a metaphor. We'll figure it out. Pick a metaphor. We're about to get there. Pretend I yeah. use it badly. Mm -hmm. um, but the law that God gave to his people mm -hmm. was wildly unique yeah. among all, all sort of ancient legal codes right. about the, the dignity that it... Um, the dignity that it ascribed to even mm -hmm. slaves, which was, and we're going to, we'll talk more about this. Don't right. go away yet. Mm -hmm. It was not a, it was not, um, it's not ideal. Well, let's get, but the, it is, it is a step forward. It was good right. for, so it, it improved humanity. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was yeah, a yeah. step forward is like leaps and bounds. Yeah. Like, like a step forward. Let's talk about that right now. Sure. Okay. So let me, uh, kind of get into the head, I guess, of the person who asked me this question, uh, where when uh, he actually did ask this, and as I was trying to explain, he kept, you can ask Yoning if he was there, mm -hmm. uh, he kept interrupting me. And mm -hmm. so he didn't really care about the answer, it seemed like. But, um, uh, and the other guy who was with us also thought the same. But uh, the question he kept asking was, all right, well, why didn't God just say it was bad? Yeah. Why did so? Why in Exodus, right? Did God or in the Bible? Uh, oh, he didn't say Exodus strictly, but why in the Bible didn't God just say that slavery was bad? And I think the first, <laughs> there are actually a few points I want to make. Yeah. One is he kind of does, definitely does. He does, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to get into verses in Exodus mm -hmm. that talk about that. By the way, I have one really interesting one sure. that no one ever reads uh, in Exodus that we'll talk to. Um, the second point, uh, Cam, maybe you want to talk about, because you were just talking about when you said it's not ideal, but it's a step forward. Why is God even making rules at all yeah. about how Israelites should treat their slaves instead of just saying, slavery is bad, don't have slaves? Yeah, that, that's, mm. um, I think, a beautiful and complex and nuanced conversation. Yeah. And 
kind of hard uh, hard to have in this format, but I'll, I'll try. Yeah. And I'll start with Jesus. So some people are trying to trip Jesus up mm-hmm. and Jesus offers his interpretation of the law of Moses concerning divorce. And I'm going to, and Jesus, uh, I'm going to take his interpretation as, as uh, true and solid. And so he's in a culture where divorce was common, regular, it was an ordinary thing to do. And he's asked this question about divorce. And Jesus says something like, for, forgive me, uh, people, for hearing this, and Lord Jesus for um, not getting your words exactly right. But he says something like, listen, Moses gave you guys rules for divorce because you have hard hearts. Mm-hmm. But it was not like this from the beginning. What he's saying is divorce was never a part of the design. Right. But now the world is fallen and mm-hmm. sinful, and because God was interacting with a certain people at a certain time who were saturated by a sinfulness, he gave them he gave them rules for divorce that were an improvement upon the practices that they were already conducting. Right, right. But not necessarily the timeless ideal. Now, God, God has described his timeless ideal, mm-hmm. and we can look back to Genesis 1 and 2 and see the picture of creation and how God designed and expected humans to interact with one another and mm-hmm. with him. And go, that, okay, that's what we were meant to do. Mm-hmm. But we've destroyed this whole thing with not just original sin, which affects all of humanity downstream, but then our own individual sin in our hearts right. and the sin that we commit in the world. So, the, the doing of the evil and the wanting to do the evil. Mm-hmm. And God found, he founded a people and gave them a law and said, okay, here's what we're doing with divorce. Like what you guys are doing with divorce is crazy. Mm-hmm. We're going to put up some, um, we, I'm, I wasn't there when God did this, but what God does is gives them rules and boundaries and guidelines mm-hmm in order to better reflect his timeless ideals right, and not just say divorce is bad. Sure. Right. So I, I'm explaining that really badly. And then the answer about slavery is the answer about slavery is similar. So right. what you have is this universal human institution. And in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to take one step back and say this here. Here's the interesting question to me. Mm-hmm. We've talked about this before is we're sort of, failing to recognize the water that we're swimming in. It's a little yeah. bit rich being in the modern West, maybe the postmodern, maybe the post postmodern mm-hmm. West. Yeah. Yeah. And then talk about our self evident moral truths mm-hmm. and then offer no further justification. There is a huge radioactive neon glowing question mark. <laughs> about where, how has it come to be that universal human rights are self-evident to us? Yeah. That is a, that is a significant question that needs, it, you, you, you cannot overestimate how significant that question is. Right. And just to say, well, it's obvious to me is mm-hmm. no answer at, well, it's almost no answer at all. It rounds down to zero. Sure. That is so, more fundamental. You know, right. why, why is slavery even bad in the first place? Why, and, where do you get in your idea that we have a human right not to be somebody's slave? I and mean, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit um, mm-hmm. snobbish, chronological snobbery. It's a little bit snobbish mm-hmm. to be at the, at the end of human civilization, right? We're, mm-hmm. we're on the leading edge of human <laughs> civilization. Yeah. And to say, well, it's obvious that slavery is wrong. And mm-hmm. go, well... You look at all of human civilization mm-hmm. up till not that long ago, and it was not obvious to anybody. Yeah. So let's be. It wasn't honest. obvious to owners. It wasn't obvious to slaves. At least a <laughs> they lot of hated slaves. It, yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. I, I. I guess. Sure. I, I well, was, I'm, I'm, I'm the only reason. Chattel slavery is. for sure. I'm talking about like all of human history. Right. Like, it was obvious to chattel slaves in like the you know British and American uh, colonies and things like that. Right. Obviously, they hated it, and they knew that it was wrong, and it was obvious to them that that was wrong and sinful. Right. But it's, but, a, it's a little bit yeah. rich mm-hmm. to sort of sit in the castle that, mm-hmm. that gospel ethics built. Yeah. And... Yeah, that's right? true. And yeah. then, and then uh, think that this is how everyone lives, mm-hmm. right? Um, 
and we're all guilty of that, but let's think about it and let's put those cards on the table and be honest about our biases and our presuppositions, but recognize that our recoiling against the practice of human slavery, it comes from somewhere. And the answer to that question, where do we even get this idea of universal human rights Mm -hmm. is substantial. (laughs) Yeah. Let's say that that's a big, big, big question. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's have some humility about it. Sure. But the question you asked in the first place was something like, so why did God give them these rules about slavery? And it was, he was teaching them something about himself Mm -hmm. and about his timeless ideals, right? We can, we can, we have the scriptures, we can look to the garden and we can see a lot about God's timeless ideals there. Mm -hmm. And he's giving them an idea about who he is and how to make progress towards God's perfect timeless ideals. And in, and, one of the ways he does it is by giving new rules about how you treat a slave, and they were revolutionary. There was mm-hmm. no other there was no other um, culture, at least in the area, that had really anything like. And I mean, I mean that in terms of nothing qualitatively similar to the rules that the the people of God, the the Hebrew mm-hmm. people, the the children of Israel, that they had for you know, the few places we find rules about how to treat your slaves. Right. There was nothing like that in the ancient world that afforded that same kind of dignity or humanity. Yeah. So, it wasn't, it's, listen, the slaves are not good and God's not saying that they're good. Right. But God is entering into people who are polygamous and idolatrous mm-hmm. and selfish and slave owning mm-hmm. and uh, committing all kinds of horrible human evil. Mm -hmm. And where they're at gives them rules that that reflect his goodness. They're not the, they're not, they're not a perfect version of his goodness. Sure. But they are a step, a a dramatic step in, uh, I don't know how to say it. Step in the right direction, I guess. Well, I mean, I'll I'll put it uh, super simply. God gave you rules about slavery because your hearts were hard, right? Well, <laughs> because you, you were know. gonna, because you yeah. were gonna have slaves anyways, because you were gonna uh, uh, take people and make them your slaves, or you're gonna hold people in debt or have indentured servitude uh, and things like that. God let you have slaves um, because your hearts were hard. Mm. Now, in that framework, God in Exodus actually gives revolutionary yeah. uh, steps forward for the time. That says, all right, if you're going to have slaves, your slaves get to have rights. What are those kinds of rights? Um, I'll tell you, uh, maybe I'll, I should have set this up uh, better. Maybe I'll do the next time somebody interrupts our skeptics failed to ask, uh, ask us a question. But this is from Exodus, okay? Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. So it's worded a little uh, strangely for English, mm-hmm. but saying if you steal a man to sell him, Anyone found in possession with him shall be put to death. Yeah. Sounds pretty uh, black and white to me. How about this one? When a man strikes his slave, male or female, that's really interesting, male or female, with a rod, if the slave dies under his hand, he shall be put to death. Mm -hmm. You can't kill your slaves. Right. You You could kill your goats or your oxen. You could break your shovels and your plows. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah. Uh, how about this one? When a man, Cam, you thought this one was interesting. Exodus 21, 26, and 27. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This one is really interesting. If someone strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go Yeah, because of his eye. If he knocks out his tooth, uh, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of their tooth. Now, I want to say something about that. That's really interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Because in legal codes from mm-hmm. other ancient Near East Called them nations. Mm-hmm. Um, there, are, there are similar. There are rule. I said there's nothing like it, and I'm mm-hmm. going to say there's something similar. Here's why they're qualitatively different. Mm-hmm. You do get something that says like if you break a slave's tooth or if you blind a slave, there's some sort of restitution. You have to pay them a certain number of shekels of silver, for mm-hmm. example. You've got to pay some money. You've got to make it up to them somehow. Those aren't affording human <laughs> dignity. Yeah. To these slaves that are being thought of more like more like property. Mm-hmm. But in this passage in Exodus, when a man strikes the eye of a slave, male or female, and destroys it, he'll sh- he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. Mm-hmm. 
That is to say that the slave has dignity and the response is not because he's broken or damaged a piece of property. But like if you break, if you uh, knock out a, a slave's tooth, mm-hmm. you have offended him as a human being and therefore have to let him go free. Mm-hmm. His not having a tooth does not affect his usefulness as a slave laborer, right? right. So yeah. it's not saying you've damaged a piece of your property and so here's the rightful restitution. Yeah, that's it's a good point. It's saying that you've offended some something's humanity mm-hmm. and you've knocked his tooth out so you have to let him go. And there's a further point which is that when we we're used to especially in the west and especially in the United States a legal code that is that has um an example and the response to every kind of behavior, mm-hmm. right? So that's why we have these convoluted legal cases that, you know, we hear that people get off on a technicality or yeah, there was yeah. a loophole. And that's because we expect every instance and every possible violation to be clearly and explicitly laid out. Mm-hmm. And then the response or punishment for that violation to also be explicitly laid out. But that's not what we're dealing with. Right, right. We're dealing with ancient Near East case law. Yeah. And the way that case law works is exactly the opposite. Case law, in fact, I'll just read this quotation. It says, ancient laws did not work this way. They were paradigmatic, giving models of behaviors and models of prohibitions or punishments relative to those behaviors, Mm. but they made no attempt to be exhaustive. Ancient laws gave guiding principles or samples rather than complete descriptions of all things regulated. Ancient people were expected to be able to extrapolate from what the the sampling, from what the sampling of laws did say Mm -hmm. to the general behavior the laws in their totality pointed toward. So that idea was, okay, Cam, so you knock out his eye or you break a tooth and there's there's some kind of response, but you can stab him in the thigh or or break his finger. Right, or Mm. the one that you said, if you beat a slave to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what if you poison his food or shoot him with an arrow or cut his head off? Mm -hmm. So then those things are all fine. No, 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 no. That's not how the, that's not even how the law worked or how it was read. The mm-hmm. point was you can't kill your slave. Mm-hmm. The point is you can't physically harm your slave. Right. And there, I have another quotation that says this: "No, I'm sorry. This law, the mm-hmm. protection of slaves from maltreatment by their masters, is found nowhere else in the entire existing corpus of ancient Near East legislation. Mm-hmm. And no other ancient Near Eastern law has been found that holds a master to account mm-hmm. for the treatment of his own slaves as distinct from injury done to the slave of another master. Mm-hmm. And the otherwise universal law regarding runaway slaves, which we haven't talked about. There is a prohibition in the Jewish law mm-hmm. against, uh, or not just a prohibition, if you received a slave from, a, a runaway slave from another nation, mm-hmm. you had to give that slave total free passage mm-hmm. in uh, in Israel. Uh, so, otherwise, universal law regarding runaway slaves, that they must be sent back with severe penalties for those who fail to comply. Hmm. But in Israel, it was different. If you received a runaway slave from a neighboring nation, you had to let that slave live as a native among the Israelites yeah. and not give him back to his masters. Yeah, I missed that verse. Yeah, yeah that's uh, crazy. I need to go look that up again. Because, but that's huge already. And so I think that I think you're exactly right. Like talking about how these laws, especially the ones about like the eye and the tooth, are not meant to be exhaustive, but they're laying down like a fundamental principle for how you're supposed to approach slaves if you have them. Um, and this is huge for the time giving slaves protections and rights and abilities to, uh, and the opportunity to uh, be set free and go. And you listen, if you have slaves, you can't just do whatever you want with them. Mm-hmm. You can't break their eye. You can't destroy their eyes or break their tooth or break their bones. You can't kill them. You can't um, steal people and sell them. You're going to be put to death. That's wrong. Um, and so all these kinds of things, and even with like slavery among uh, Hebrew people in, in their lives, um, there's a great verse in Exodus 21 two that says, if you buy a Hebrew servant, let's hit pause real quick. If you buy a Hebrew servant mm-hmm. or slave, if you buy, it doesn't say go and buy a Hebrew servant, right. go and buy a Hebrew slave. Like that's, that's a good thing. But if you buy a Hebrew slave, a uh, slave, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. 
So they're not your slave for life. You don't get to own people, but they get to work for you. They get to serve you for six years. And in the seventh year, they get to go free. And then uh, further down, I didn't write down these verses there, but um, there is provision if the slave likes his master and his family, he can actually marry into the family and become family and uh, become you know an equal member of the family and continue to work for the master who pays him and supports him. And so I think all of that uh, already right there makes a really interesting case for the thing I started with the with uh, at the very beginning, which right. is that there's more to the conversation. There's, there's a, much a, more, much more to the conversation than just, well, God let people keep slaves, and that's wrong. Slavery is wrong. We just read a bunch of verses Mm -hmm. from Exodus that lays down the principle of uh, you cannot steal someone, you can't kill your slaves, you can't destroy their eyes or any part of their body, you can't hurt them. You had to let them go every seven years. Every seven years. And if someone indentures himself to you, you have to let him go too. And if he wants Mm -hmm. to, and you just talked about if he he loves you and wants to stay, which Mm -hmm. is interesting that that would make it into the text if it was if it was a thing that didn't happen right but then just before that it says you can't let him go empty-handed you have to if mm-hmm. when uh, at the seventh year when you let that indentured person go then you have to it says when you let him go free you shall not let him go empty-handed you shall furnish him liberally out of your flock mm-hmm. out of your threshing floor and out of your wine press right. as the lord your god has blessed you you shall give to him you mm-hmm. shall remember that you were a slave in the land of egypt and mm-hmm. the lord your god redeemed you yeah so taking all of that, putting that together, um, if you ask us the question of like, why didn't God condemn slavery? I think it's pretty obvious that any kind of form of chattel slavery violates, violated all of those commands in the Bible. Those are commands, those are moral principles laid out by God, and everyone violated those when they were practicing chattel slavery. Okay, now I want to change gears just a little bit, unless mm-hmm. there was something else you wanted to add, Cam, because now I want to talk about the hard one, the one that the yeah. guy actually was I'll asking make one about. one more point. Go ahead. And then we'll get to the hard one, yeah, and yeah. that is this. So we just read, um, so there's this thread through the Old Testament, God saying, remember, you were slaves in Egypt, and mm-hmm. I liberated you. So bear that in mind and bless other people the way, the way that I blessed you. Mm-hmm. And then he gives... Um, he gives rules about how to treat people given that they have this right. horrible slave practice. But what's interesting is saying that they were that you people were slaves in mm-hmm. Egypt. Let's remember how that came about. Mm-hmm. So, because um, I think this is an interesting part of the story. Joseph was sold by his brothers as a slave, mm-hmm. which again was was illegal. You weren't allowed to sell free people as as a slave. Mm-hmm. But he sold. They sold Joseph. To some, to some merchants. Eventually, Joseph is sold to some Egyptians, and we know how that story goes. Mm-hmm. And then he's, he confronts his family, his brothers who had sold him into slavery, and he says to them, mm-hmm. what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So he's acknowledging that selling him into slavery was an evil thing to have done. So mm-hmm. it was not, he's not affirming the slavery at all. Right. And then eventually, you have the Israelites in Egypt, and then you have the Pharaoh saying, wait a minute, these Hebrew people, they're having too many kids and they're having too much influence Mm -hmm. and the state oppresses them. Hmm. They were not sold into Egypt as property of other people. Yeah, yeah. The state of Egypt, however you want to conceive of that government, Mm -hmm. the state of Egypt oppressed them as slaves. And so in this case, I think it's important that we just, ooh, they're doing construction literally above (laughs) our heads. I hope you can hear that, yeah. Uh, I was worried (laughs) that hammer might fall through and hit me. Mm -hmm. Um, the example here of slaves is that the, the state can uh, be the oppressive one who is enslaving you. So they were forced to do labor against their will, mm-hmm. and God delivered them even, for, even from that. And that is another one of the practices that belongs in that basket of things we call slavery that we talked about earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And then that, that also raises some interesting questions about, and even in the, in the modern world, our relationship with our nation state. Yeah. And... And are the um, the right treatment of people, even as governors and rulers, how are we allowed to how are we allowed to treat the people that we govern, rule, and oversee? Mm-hmm. But that's a that's a conversation for another day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so so the, I, the hard one. I wanted to I wanted to say that before we moved on. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I mean, this will be, we'll close with like two things. And so uh, we'll talk about the difficult one because I do want to talk about the verse that the guy actually asked me about. Yeah. So earlier I read Exodus 21, 20. I intentionally did not read verse 21 because I want to talk about it here. Um, I'm not going to pretend like this verse doesn't exist. And I'm not going to pretend like this verse isn't difficult to, uh, to wrestle with like as a Christian. So let me read 20 and 21 together. Verse 20, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged, and the master uh, shall be put to death, is, the, is, is what that means. Mm-hmm. But verse 21 says, but if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. Yeah. So it's a little difficult. Um, a lot difficult, I guess uh, we could say, because it kind of sounds like, uh, well, I mean, what are you talking about? If he hits a slave and he doesn't die within a day or two, like nothing happens, like what goes on? And what's this whole deal about the slave being their money or whatever? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I can't talk too much about slave being their money, um, uh, but I know that there's um, the connotation that that the slave uh, works for the master, helps provide uh, the master with money, uh, there's supposed to be something around the word that uh, protects the dig- dignity of the slave. I'm not an expert. Go read an expert on yeah. that because I can't really speak too much on that. But I want to, first of all, make a distinction between what this verse actually says and how the gentleman asked me the question. The way he asked me the question was, why does the Bible, why does God say it's okay to beat your slave as long as they don't die within a day or two? Right. And that's literally not what the verse says. The, right. The, I mean, yeah, exactly. Imagine there are lo- we have laws <laughs> against rape in the United States and in Norway. Right, right. And so say it's 20 years in prison is the punishment for rape. That's like saying, why does the law say it's okay to rape somebody so long as you go to prison for 20 years? Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Uh, listen, the, <laughs> the scripture is not saying, God does not say it's okay to beat your slave. We just mm-hmm. read verses that follow this one, verse 26 and 27, mm-hmm. that say, it's not okay to beat your slave. If you hurt them, if you damage a part of their body, uh, they get to go free with, with, without paying anything. Um, and so I think one of the things that we want to at least make a distinction of is that the slaves still had protection against harsh beatings. They still had protections, uh, legal protections about uh, being killed, about uh, anything, about being sold, about being stolen, all of these protections. Uh, and yes, there was, uh, uh, there is this verse that says if a, if a slave owner or a master hits their slaves, beats their slaves, and they don't die within a day or two, then nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's difficult. I don't think, again, uh, rep- representing what going back to something Cam said earlier, this doesn't represent the ideal. God isn't saying it's okay to beat your slave, mm-hmm. but with the context at the time, with the rights that slaves had in the surrounding nations, this law, I think objectively, mm-hmm. was much better yeah. compared to what was around the cultures at the time. Yeah, and rep- this is what this is the point we actually need to end on, which is that these laws serve, it's kind of a reiteration of a point we made earlier, but these laws serve as a redemptive um, narrative, or they serve redemptive purposes to redeem a sinful practice and not saying this is how it's good, but this is how we can uh, learn about who God is, how we treat other human beings, even marginalized human beings under our care, under mm-hmm. our power, if you will. Yeah. And we, if, if we, if Cam, if you and I were slave owners, and the Exodus oh, law, we cannot do anything we want to right. our people. We need to be good to them. And guess what? They can't be ours forever. Mm-hmm. We got to let them go at some point. Mm-hmm. At the, or they can become our family, and then they right. become equal status with us mm-hmm. in our family. And that's where so, yeah. Uh, right, so this is what Jesus gets at. I'm sorry, I know you, uh, you said we're going to end with something, so I want to put my thoughts in before we do that. Yeah, yeah. But that's mm-hmm. what Jesus gets at when he just says, the law, the law and prophets is this, right? Love God mm-hmm. and love each other. Right. And humanity has been so bad at that since, uh, since first being tempted and sinning, right? So since mm-hmm. we have this ideal in creation, we break it, and then all of the people afterwards have been really bad at love God and love people. Mm-hmm. So we get rules, and the rules mm-hmm. are where we're at, helping us to see sort of the next the next level, the next stage, the next thing. And I think I said something before and it sounded slightly judgy and this is going to sound judgy again. I said something, mm-hmm. something like it's really rich. 
in the post-postmodern West to look around and presume that our moral opinions are are self-evident or should have been self-evident to all people in all times. We don't Mm -hmm. see the water that we're swimming. We don't feel the water that we're swimming in, right? right? But also what we presume is that there's no further, like this is the thought that I, since we talked about the topic that we wanted, that since we talked about doing a podcast on this topic, what has been racing through my mind is the extreme presumption that it is that we are not currently practicing horrible, abominable Mm -hmm. evil that someday in the future either other human societies will recognize right. or we're not just fail, failing we're not just seeing how we fall short of God's perfect standard mm-hmm. so the, what does what do the scriptures say are sin any action not born of the spirit is sin mm-hmm. well that's just that's just so much <laughs> like when Jesus <laughs> yeah. sa- Jesus says if you've been angry with your brother in your heart then you've mm-hmm. committed the sin of murder mm-hmm. and he doesn't take anything off that he doesn't say because you know they're sort of the same thing. Like he just right, right, right. he just leaves it there. You're a murderer in your heart. You're a murderer in mm. your heart. Mm. And I go whoa. And most people think about it and they go, well, I can't even control that. So <laughs> God Himself is saying it's a sin like murder, or it is the sin of murder. Mm-hmm. And we are so blasé about it that we go, I can't even control that. If you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, God uses that that term of adultery as like a harsh term He uses about His own people being prostitutes after other gods. That's mm-hmm. not a that's not a minor thing. He's not it's not just stepping out on your wife, right? It's a, it's violating a covenant. Mm-hmm. He says if you've lusted after another woman, you've committed adultery. Mm-hmm. And you go, I can't even help that. Like mm-hmm. I can't, what do I have to do about what my heart does? It's like, no, no, no. This is a sin that is so grievous that God mm-hmm. calls it a that God calls it adultery. And we think of it as the kind of, like, it doesn't even occur to us that that might even be bad or that we even could do something about it. Mm -hmm. So, when we compare even our current moral attitudes towards the perfect holiness of Almighty God Mm -hmm. against the moral perfection that is, let me say it this way, the moral perfection that is rightful of human dignity. Mm -hmm. We live so below our nature that the things that God calls egregiously sinful and immoral, we think... I don't even have any control over that. Mm -hmm. I think we don't take that idea nearly seriously enough. So it's one thing to say, maybe in a thousand years, they find, uh, they find Norway's moral code or they find, you know, the federal register of laws in the United States. Mm -hmm. And they go, look at this. It was okay to rape somebody. So long as you went to jail for a certain amount of time Mm -hmm. or whatever, and that's a wrong way to read the law. But imagine there's further moral progress in the world in the next millennium. Mm -hmm. And we go, look at these barbarians and how they exist. They, they just had, and I could think of a bunch of things. I won't, I won't Mm -hmm. state them now, but all of these things that are sinful and immoral and wicked. Mm -hmm. And you go, why didn't God just tell them? Yeah, And I go, well, Jesus showed up and he did. He did just tell us. Mm-hmm. He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. None of us do that. And love your neighbors yourself. None of us do that. We fall way, way, way short. And in our falling short, he goes, okay, mm-hmm. here's some ways to help you be less awful while you're on your way to uh, with the law as a schoolmaster. Mm-hmm. While you're on your way learning to live the, the way that you were designed, here are some... Um, Here's some statutes and some rules mm. and some guidelines to live less awfully while you're learning to be, while you're learning to express the timeless ideals that God created us with in the first place. Yeah. No, I think that that is how, I think that's the proper way to understand the issue. Mm. I think that that um, really wraps it up. And I mean, you're right. I mean, we do fall way, 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 way short, mm-hmm. but I think pretty clearly um, from the Old Testament and the New Testament mm-hmm. Uh, you find that God thinks that slavery is one of those ways that we fall way, 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 way mm-hmm. short in. Um, yeah. and uh, evidence that we've practiced. I want to say yeah. one last thing before you wrap up. Okay. So there was a rule about if you have a slave and you beat him and he doesn't die, then you don't have to be killed or, or let him go. Mm. Well, his release, his release is coming. And there were rules about fights between non-slave people, right? Just any two Hebrews. Mm-hmm. And if you got in a fight with somebody and you didn't kill him, then there was some sort of restitution to be paid, but your life wasn't taken. Yeah. So it, in, in this case, it treats the, the slave does not have the same dignity and value as a free person. Mm-hmm. 
but has close to the same dignity and value as a free person, and in a way that is qualitatively qualitatively different from any other surrounding culture at yeah. any at any point before that. Right. Yeah. I think the thrust of the verse is, and I should have said this earlier. Um, the thrust of the verse is that the the slave owner doesn't die. Right. That, that's the point. Is that we right. don't kill him because he didn't kill the slave. Right. Not that. It's okay to be like that. And then that's what's not coming, what it says. And then yeah. what's coming up is, and if you injure him, you have to let him go. Yeah, exactly. That's that comes like, like literally five verses. That's what's later. coming next. So the, the thrust of that verse is, if you don't kill your slave, you don't have to die, which right. was true of any other person. If I didn't, if we got into yeah. a fight and I didn't kill you, I didn't have to pay with my life. Yeah. yeah. And then, but if you injure them, you have to, let, to them, let them. You go. have to let them go. And even if it's an injury that doesn't affect their value to you as a mm-hmm. laborer. Even if it's something that just affects their dignity as a human being, like knocking mm-hmm. out their tooth. Yeah. That's the interesting one. Because when you said that, I hadn't considered that. But I was like, yeah, your eye would affect mm-hmm. your usefulness to your master. But a tooth? A tooth would not. And the, the, then the fact that the Hebrew law, God says, you need to let your slaves go, even if you hurt parts of their body mm-hmm. that don't affect their labor— was really interesting. I, yeah. I had not considered that before. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, it's, but, it means that the law is related to their human dignity, not their yeah. usefulness. Great point. We we got to wrap up. Okay. And so uh, I appreciate everything uh, you said, Cam. Uh, everyone who's listening to this, uh, every, obviously, everything we said here is not the end of the conversation. We have not solved the problem. Yet. I do not. Definitely not. Um, well, I think that uh, what you said earlier solves the problem, but there's more to be said. And yeah, I'm not right. going to pretend like uh, verse 21 in Exodus chapter 21 is the only hard one. Right. That's definitely not what I'm saying at all. There are definitely very difficult uh, verses that can be read in the light of the redemption narrative that God is telling through the Old Testament law. Um, I hope you leave this video and go listen to someone else who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> so maybe somebody like Paul Copan, excellent Christian philosopher. Yeah. He's done a lot of work in this area. And there's lots of other great resources online that you can talk, uh, you can look up about mm-hmm. difficult passages and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I think this is all we have to say about it. This is kind of how we would respond to it when Norwegians ask. Yeah. So we thank you for listening and we'll see you again next week. God bless. Thank you for listening to Word First Radio. Be sure to like, subscribe, and check us out online at wordfirst.us. Yeah!